Well, good morning, church. All right. It's good to see all your smiling faces out there. And it's good to see the house of the Lord so well filled. It is good to be in the, here at Cornerstone Mennonite Fellowship on such a warm day. And uh, I'm anticipating a wonderful service where we can worship the Lord and glean from his truths. Um, I also want to welcome those that are uh, tuning in via live stream or also through the phone system. So it is good to have you with us. Also for those that maybe will be watching uh, this video on the internet later this week or whenever, I want to welcome you to our service and uh, that, you can, that you can be a part of us. I was thinking this morning, um, one of my favorite times of the week is, uh, is a Sunday morning. And the reason I enjoy a uh, Sunday morning would be early. I like to get up early on a Sunday morning and come downstairs um, in the cool of the day and when it's quiet before the children get up. And uh, I do some reading and reflecting and uh, thinking about the service ahead, especially if I have responsibilities. And um, just kind of thinking through things and meditating on what I read. But I was thinking, there's a person that used to attend here, a man that is having an amazing Sunday morning. And of course, we know that as Elvin. He used to sit here with the, um, right here in the, in, the, uh, in the front, off to the left, where the, the benches are notched out. And if you stood at this podium over the last several years, you've always seen Elvin there. And um, he's going to be missed, isn't he? And our hearts grieve for that. And we need to grieve for that. He was a man in our congregation that always brought me inspiration, even though all the difficulties that he had. And um, we need to acknowledge that. But at the same time, it is a day of celebration, knowing that this morning he is having the most wonderful worship service that any of us ever will have. And I know that theology of heaven isn't exactly right because in heaven there is no time and there is no Sunday morning. We constantly are in a state of worship and um, surrounded by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And um, yeah, I, I just can't imagine what he's experiencing right now, especially absent from his body that was so broken and, and uncomfortable. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I was, was reading this morning, I, uh, I was thinking of, of John 11 and just some hope during this time of, uh, of loss. And this is Jesus talking to Martha after the loss of Lazarus. And John 11, verse 25, and Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks a question to Martha, do you believe? Elvin believed, and he is in heaven experiencing a wonderful thing right now. And that's being surrounded by other saints and being with his Lord and Savior and uh, absent from his body. And I just want to acknowledge that. And I want to do something a little bit different just in, in that acknowledgement. I want to have a special prayer for Glenda. I see you're sitting right there where you always do, if you don't mind. So let's just bow our heads. And if you're around, Glenda, maybe put your hands on her. And we're just going to have a, a short prayer for, for Glenda and what she's going through, and especially um, for this coming week. Dear Father, I just thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for this privilege to coming to church. Father, you know we're absent a brother, and you know the, the happenings of this week and Elvin passing from this life to his eternal reward. And Lord, we just thank you so much for that. We thank you, Lord, that he's in your presence and worshiping you this morning. Lord, absent from his broken and battered body, and I just, I just praise you for that. But Lord, you know it's lost here on, heaven, here on earth, and I just pray that you could comfort uh, Glenda and Caleb and Kezi and, and the rest of the family, Lord, this coming week. Just be with them, guide them, direct them, give them grace and understanding through this difficult time. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Okay, so just the, uh, the itinerary of this morning. Um, we're going to have our worship time just shortly with Josh, and also Dave's going to help with that. And then we're going to have another children's church, and Craig Copenhaver has agreed to do that, so we're looking forward to that. Then, of course, our announcements, and then our sermon by Brother Nelson. He's been preparing this week to bring us a sermon, so that'll be really good. And then, of course, at the end is sharing time. And I will mention um, the offering baskets are still at the back, and this morning it's for ministerial aid. And as one of your minister ministers, I appreciate 
um, your giving toward that fund. So if you haven't given, uh, do that in the next few minutes here because they usually like to collect that during worship time. So um, as we come into worship, why don't we stand and I'm going to have a word of prayer and then we'll turn things over to Josh and to Dave. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, once again for a beautiful day. I thank you, Lord, for paying the ransom, Lord, for our salvation and that we are able to take uh, advantage of that and, Lord, that we can come and commune with you this morning because of that. Lord, I just lift this service up to you. I lift up the worship team here. I lift up Nelson. I lift up Craig and the Children's Church and all those that have part. Just guide us and direct us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I would just also uh, say, I think, and acknowledge that Brother Elvin isn't here, and I didn't know Elvin long, but... The brother always encouraged me as a singer, and he did that many times, and that was appreciated. And I'll never forget the time I was sitting right over there, and he had devotions up here, and he asked me to sing a chorus from a song that he chose about heaven, and I was delighted to do that for him. Uh, so this morning, I've just chosen the songs uh, for thousands of years. People have turned to the Psalms as scripture to sing and to read in times of passing in times of mourning and uh, have offered prayers and we have some songs of prayers this morning uh, and then closing it out uh, with some songs of heaven and some songs of worship so let's worship together arise and sing ye children of zion arise and sing ye children of zion for the lord hath delivered thee arise and sing ye children of zion for the lord hath delivered heart and rejoice before him. Open up your heart and rejoice before him. Open up your heart and rejoice before him. For the King Lord is your God. Sing it again. Arise and sing. Arise and sing, ye children of Zion. For the Lord hath delivered me. Rise and sing, ye children of Zion. For the your heart and rejoice before him. Open up your heart and rejoice before him. Open up your heart and rejoice before him. For the Lord is your God. Hear my cry, O Lord. Hear my cry, O Lord. Attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto
speaks of dancing with all your might, and we know Elvin was relegated to a chair for the latter years of his life, but just in thinking through uh, the glorious freedom and restoration that his brother Elvin has.
Jesus Christ. Let us walk worthy of our calling. And as we remember, Lord, as a congregation, our brother Alvin and sister Glenda that's here, I pray that you would help us to support uh, the Heisey family. Just pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts, that you would give us ears to hear, and let us be changed by the word of God. And this is in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, you see it? I pulled together some pieces of equipment this morning, and uh, hopefully I can use them. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about, uh, to the children about um, guidance. And um, how many of you children like to swim? Let's see hands. Swim or go to the shore? Great. Well, I, I, as a little boy, my parents had a, a camper down at the shore, and we used to go down there, and, and my dad got into boating. So we got a boat, and... My dad liked fishing a lot. His grandpa liked fishing. And so we got into fishing. Um, we went out in the ocean. And sometimes when we were out in the ocean, storms arose. And we couldn't get back in right away. Out in the ocean, it's sudden. It's, it's, it's very quick. And um, so we had to get a canal. We used to follow our way in to the canal. I borrowed this wakeboard from my um, brother-in-law, my son-in-law, and with this you need a boat to pull you, and with it you need a person standing in the boots, and that person controls that wakeboard, and whether he turns, leans to the left, whether he leans to the right, and as the boat goes, it makes the waves, and those waves are what causes you to do the tricks that you want to do. Now he was good at it, but. I never did it, so I'm not, I'm not sure about it. <clears throat> How many of you know what this is? How many children know what this is? DeAndre. 
It's a propeller, yes. And this propeller guides a boat. It sets it on course. The person at the front steers it, but the propeller is what turns it and controls it and propels it forward. So it's a propeller, yes. In our lives, we need that guidance in our lives. We need that person in control of our lives. If you've ever been at Jane and Cindy Lockman's house, we were in a small group when we first started, and down there they have a river, they have a stream down there, and they have a, a canoe that you can go out in. Our children loved going out in that canoe. And with that canoe, you need guidance though with that too. So Jay gives them an oar, and when you get out, you start paddling, one to the left, to the right, and it sets your guidance, it sets your course in life. Um, in the Bible, um, we have this guidance as well. I'm going to just relate a story. Everybody on your left, give three strong forward strokes. And the people on the left, give the three forward strokes. Those on your right, give your guidance to the right. And three strokes to the right. And it got away from the storm that was uh, from the shore, from the storms that were causing. Um, it gave you a forward stroke. And white water rafting, the white water rafting guy would shout. Those on the left dug in, pulling our raft away from the churning vortex. For several hours, we learned the importance of listening to our guide instructions. His in his steady voice enabled six men with little rafting experience to work together to plot the safest course down the raging river. Here we see that without that guide, without that person telling the course, the raging river would have engulfed them. The rapids would have been, been there and, and overtook them. Life has its share of whitewater rapids. One moment, it's smooth sailing. And next you see turbulent storms coming in. So you gotta be quick. You gotta be, and then they flash the, the paddling like a mad dog to, to get out of the certain uh, whirlpools. And those tense moments make us keenly aware of our need for a skilled guide. I'm gonna be re re reading some verses out of Psalms 32. Verse 6, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray for you, while you may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach, you, reach him. You are my hiding place. You are my protector. Protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the ways you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Here we see that God is our uh, guide. He's our instructor. So we can take comfort in knowing the fact that God promises, I will counsel you with, your, with my loving eye on you. He will remember to guide us in life. So when we get in these times of situations that we are in trouble, not only in trouble, but when we have rejoicing, we can seek God for our guidance and our protection in life. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your promises to be my guide and in our lives to be our, our, our there for us. Lord, just protect these children as they come to age of accountability, that they would search you and seek you to be their guide in their life. Lord, just as we adult, adults need guides in our lives, Lord, just help us to uh, direct our children in, in the way they should go and grow. And Lord, just use us as a church to be that beacon of light for those around about us. What we ask in your name, amen. Thank you, Craig, for that children's church, very practical lesson of trusting in God.
through the uh, illustration of a wakeboard and, uh, and a propeller. Although I'm not sure if Craig would have used that recently, but uh, yeah, it looks like it would be fun, especially on a warm day like today. Also, a thank you for Dave and for Josh for uh, those songs, very appropriate. Thank you for using your God-given gifts uh, for that. Um, along with the Children's Church, um, this is, if I counted right, this is the 12th Sunday that we've been back since the whole shutdown. And you know, uh, the church service is reorganized and we've been doing things a lot differently. But out of those 12 Sundays, 11 of you have chosen to do to children's church. And you know, if you've done children's church, you probably got a text or a phone call from me. And you said, oh, Andy's calling. I know what he wants, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I really appreciate you helping uh, not just me out, but the children out in um, doing some of those children's church. Those that have done it, and I know some of you that didn't suit. I know some of you, you said, oh, I don't really feel comfortable standing up in front of everyone. And I realize standing up here isn't for everybody. But I just really want to thank you for, um, for doing that. I know sometimes we had some last-second uh, children's churches. I remember getting a text, like, as I'm sitting down um, one Sunday, a gentleman texted me and said, sure, he'll do it within 10 minutes or so. So we cut it close sometimes. But I really thank you for, for doing that, and uh, I really appreciate it. And along with that... Um, this is the last Sunday that things are going to be a little bit different. Next Sunday, we're going to be going back to our full service with starting at 9 o'clock, not 9.30, so you're going to have to get up half an hour earlier, however you want to do that. But uh, Sunday School will be in progress, and also um, greeters will be in progress. If you look at uh, your bulletin, which I have here somewhere, on the left side, you're going to see a list of greeters in the month of August. If you've lost your paper, Bonnie was kind enough to put that in. And um, if you're one of these greeters and you're thinking, oh, I still don't feel comfortable shaking hands and all that, um, you know, do your fist bumps or your arm things or whatever, um, or don't shake, don't shake at all. And um, the rest of the congregation, I would just ask that we would respect that. And um, so just because you're greeters doesn't mean that you have to shake hands. You can be a non-contact um, greeter, so to speak. So, um, yeah, just keep that in mind. The next Sunday, we are open at 9 o'clock, and uh, the services will resume like we did, um, oh, man, three months ago, four months ago. So just keep that in mind. Okay, I have several announcements here, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to uh, share your announcements first. So if you have uh, an announcement, the gentlemen are at the back with the mics, so go ahead and make your announcements. Okay, we have Ben and uh, Paul over here. Also yeah, just an announcement for uh, Sunday school restarting next Sunday. Uh, yeah, just a reminder as teachers, for the younger classes, uh, please uh, discuss that between the teachers in your class. And uh, you can just decide what lessons you want to teach out of the books that we started back in March, I guess it would have been. Or, yeah. So, yeah, just discuss it. It's, it'll be five Sundays, I guess, in August. For the younger classes so you can just pick out what uh, lessons you want to teach in those books and then also for the adult we will st be still using the books that we also started back then and in the book of Romans going through Romans there so if you don't have your book uh, we do have some more you can talk to Jan or I and we can make sure you get one uh, teachers yeah we also have some teachers books if, if for chance you don't have it please talk to one of us and we'll make sure you get one and the lessons that we'll be looking at, you should have all got a paper in your mailbox. That was probably back in the beginning of July, a couple of weeks ago. So just look at that paper if you have it. If not, talk to one of Jan or I or down on the mailboxes. I hung one up there that shows which lessons we, we will be looking at for those Sundays in August. And yeah, if, if you have any questions, please talk to Jan or I and we'll yeah, help you out. Okay, thank you, Ben. Thank you to our superintendents navigating through this whole thing. You guys did a wonderful job. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, just wanted to let everybody know the new applications for the school scholarships are on the back table here. And the due dates on it, I think it's in a few weeks. So if, you could, if you're interested, please fill them out. And uh, you can put it in Doug Raymer. John Hurst or my mailbox when they're filled out. The other thing uh, that I wanted to just make an announcement this morning is 
If you remember the Way of Jesus Academy School in Lancaster City, they had a presentation here, I don't know, they might be getting close to a year ago. They are down to the wire looking for a fifth grade teacher. And uh, I just thought if you, if you are interested or know anybody who's interested, speak to me or just contact the school directly. Thanks. Thank you for me. Next Sunday, uh, August the 2nd, we are planning to have a night of singing, and it will be here at the church starting at 6.30. So come on out, bring your voices, bring the children's. There will be a little children's time uh, during the evening, and uh, there will be no snack afterward, uh, just time of fellowship and singing and, and worshiping God uh, starting at 6.30 here at the church. Let's go ahead, Doug. Yeah, as... Um you most of you have heard in the back of the uh, room here. There's a sign-up sheet for the remaining positions on the no for the nominating committee, um, and there are positions like librarian, song leader, usher, etc. And what we're asking is if you would be willing to sign up. And um, I guess I would like to just encourage you that everyone has a gift, and you know what that gift is. And if you feel like you know I could do this. Um, be humble enough to sign up, and it'll be good for you. Um, if you don't use it, you lose it. So uh, I would really encourage you to, uh, to consider what, what God's laying on your heart as to what your gift might be, what you're comfortable with, and uh, sign up. Yes, thank you, Doug. And I'll put in a plug for that. I had looked back there last, or this Sunday, this morning, and I think there was one name, and there was a lot of empty slots. Um, so, like we said, this is a little bit different if you were here at business meeting, and I think Jim announced it last Sunday, but uh, use your time, use your talents for the church, for the Bride of Christ, and take advantage of that. Yeah. Any other announcements that you'd like to share? I'll just say one other thing with uh, next Sunday's service and getting back to normal, if we can say that. Um, we are going to continue to have prayer time or sharing time at the end of the service uh, because we're uh, a continuing live stream and we want that to be kind of a private, close-knit thing. Um, so that will be at the end of the service. We're going to continue that and we'll, we'll turn off live stream. Another thing I wanted to say, another announcement I wanted to say, um, men's retreat. Um, I think Nelson said something at business meeting about it and that is coming up in about two months. And that is, um, instead of October, when we usually had it, it will be in September, September 18 and 19. And we're having Dave Uter come down. And um, I know it pleases a lot of you guys that it was in September. So uh, show up, sign up. Next Sunday, we're going to have a sign-up sheet in the back. And make sure you sign up for that. And also, we'll put some more information in your mailboxes. Um, once again, it's going to be at Woodcrest. And um, lots of fun and... Uh, bonding, I guess you could say, with our men, and a lot of good teaching with Dave. He's a, he's a really good teacher. Um, another announcement I have, we've, as a church, we've received this thank you card for Blessings of Hope. If you look in your bulletin, there's different things to give to, different separate accounts, and Blessings of Hope is one of them, and it just simply says, thank you for your recent donation to Blessings of Hope. Your support is greatly appreciated. God bless David B. Lapp. So um, thank you for your giving, and I know some of you um, actually volunteer there. And so thank you for, for giving your time and your, uh, your monies to that cause. Um, I think that's everything I have. We are looking forward to hearing what Nelson has to say. Um, he's pre been preparing all week, and um, it'll be good to see what the Lord has laid on his heart. Is there any other announcements before, I, before we pray? If not, let's uh, bow our heads, and then um, Nelson can come forward. Dear Father in heaven, Thank you, Lord, once again for another day. Thank you, Lord, that we're able to come to this church and to worship you, Lord, unmolested by the authorities. And, Lord, we just pray for um, the churches out across the world, Lord, that don't have this privilege. Lord, I just pray that you could just guide them and direct them, um, keep them safe, encourage them, fill them with your, with your spirit, and just guide and direct them. Lord, um, now as we sit here and anticipate uh, your spirits working in our lives through the preaching of Nelson, Lord, I just pray that you could hide him behind the cross, guide him and direct him. Lord, um, help us not just to be hearers of the word, but also doers. Lord, empower Nelson, guide and direct him. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
I want to begin by relaying an account that I've experienced not too long ago on the job site. I was called out to a customer's place where the house was run down a little bit and found out that the granddaughter of the deceased grandmother, the granddaughter wanted to buy the house, buy the estate. Since it was her grandparents, she had a lot of memories there and she just thought it would be so awesome to own the place that she had made so many memories there with her grandparents. But she didn't have any money and she didn't even have a job, okay? And to make matters worse, she had a knee injury which temporarily handicapped her. So her parents, wanting to help her, wanting to make this dream come true, refinanced their home and were preparing to put the money down for buying this estate, this house, and they hired me to fix up the walls and the ceilings. Meanwhile, the daughter was dreaming of what it would be like to have this, this house is going to be mine, what colors the walls are going to be, how she's going to decorate this. And one day, her father kindly confronted her there on the job site while I was there, and he said, well, if you, if you want to do all these things, you have to open up your checkbook. And she said, well, I don't have, I don't have any. So she had to get help to clean out the house from the estate that was left there by her grandmother. She needed financing backed by her parents. She needed help to fix it up, and she probably even needed help to paint the house. And it seems obvious that probably even their parents were going to land up making the payments on the mortgage. So it's kind of a kind of a crazy situation there. I want to talk to you this morning about everything borrowed. That's the title of the message this morning, Everything Borrowed. And I want to talk about the sin of pride. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 15, Old Testament. It's right after Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel chapter 15. And God is addressing his people in a way that is to humble them because of their arrogance in living independent of God. So it's a real short chapter. I believe it's, it's only six, eight verses. Ezekiel chapter 15, it's a parable of the vine. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work? Or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel, and the fire devoureth both ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. Is it meat for any work? Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat yet for any work, when the fire hath devoured it, and it is burned? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. They shall go out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. And I will make the land desolate because they have committed a trespass, saith the Lord. I want to look at this parable, and I want to acknowledge that the inspiration for this sermon comes from Harold Vaughn. He has a sermon you may listen to online if you want to called Roadblock to Revival. But I want to talk about the sin of pride. And this parable here addresses Israel as a nation who was barren of fruit. Okay, They had forgotten God. They, the dependency on God had become old-fashioned. They weren't seeking God anymore. They were no longer willing to obey when they couldn't see. They didn't want to obey God when they couldn't see the outcome. And that's exactly what made Abraham the father of the faithful because he obeyed God when he didn't know the outcome. So they weren't willing to trust God with things they couldn't see, so they wanted to be in charge themselves. They didn't seek God's face anymore. 
There was a spirit of independence. They were not set apart, and they were failing to be the beacon of hope to the nations around them. Craig addressed that in children's church this morning. So here's this parable. Ezekiel confronts them with the reality of their shame. And he says, if the vine, if a vine does not produce fruit, what is it worth? Okay? God is the husbandman. Israel as a nation was the vine. And God longed to see fruit. He had cared for them. He had nurtured them. He even pruned them when they were in the wilderness. Okay? We know what that's like to be disciplined. Um, God was expecting to see new growth and fruit. But Ezekiel says, you know, vine wood, or vine itself, if it doesn't produce fruit, is just like any other wood. And if you take vine wood, I haven't found a carpenter yet that makes anything useful out of vine wood, okay? Maybe some kind of wreath or ornament today. But he's saying as far as a piece of furniture... Not even a carpenter would take time to carve a peg or a little pin to even hang a cup on. I mean, it's just when you prune a grape arbor, you burn the, the vines. It's trash. It's not even wood that, that heats a home. It's just burned as brush. The very thing that makes a vine valuable and have purpose is that it bears fruit. So this parable is for us today in this sense. This is for the humbling of the church we need to remember that the church has nothing to offer the world but Christ. Okay, We're not promoting good business ethics. For as good as we are and hard workers as we are, we're not promoting good business. We're not promoting time management or organization or self-motivation or equality or social justice. Our duty as God's people is to magnify the Lord Jesus. We are who we are by God's grace, and we're nothing outside of the work of the Lord Jesus in our lives. I, for one, would be a terrible sinner, a shameful sinner, if it wouldn't be for what Christ has done in my life in changing my perspective and my desires. Whatever we are, we have nothing to make us proud. We are debtors to Christ. Did you ever consider yourself to be a debtor? Like that girl that wanted to buy her house, she had to lean on her parents for the mortgage. She had to have somebody help her the whole way through. Do you ever picture yourself like that? We don't have anything to say that's our own except our sin and our self-will. The church today needs a dose of humility. And like Israel, we need to be reminded of our dependence on God and our responsibility to God. So I want to talk to you this morning about the sin of pride. Pride is the central sin of humanity. It's just ingrained in our nature. I remember when I was first ordained as a pastor and I was doing a lot of reading and writing down a lot of notes and, and listening to sermons, those kind of things, and I wanted to keep them in a file, and so I made a file for in the, the file box, and I put on the tab there um, notes and thoughts from other great men, and I went to put it in my file there. I didn't think anything of it. Then I came back and I opened up my file sometime later and I looked at this. I'm like, oh wait, notes from other great men. This is in my files. That doesn't even make sense. That sounds like I'm some great person. And I erased it. And now it says notes from great men. Okay? It's, I'm not one of them. <laughs> it's ingrained in the way we think. So we have sayings like this that we, we say sometimes. Um, if you can't run with the big dogs, stay on the porch, okay? Or maybe you've seen bumper stickers. Um, my German shepherd is smarter than your stick family. All those kinds of things. Do you see that kind of stuff? It's just kind of ingrained in us maybe to jab or to let people know that we're uh, at least on par with them or maybe a little better. Pride is not only arrogance but includes self-will. It's something we all are born in, even a child. You take something from them, they become stiff and angry. Can't do this to me, this is mine. So it's a lack of admission or surrender. And this kind of attitude is an affront to God, and God will not overlook it. It's the same thing that got Adam and Eve thrown out of the garden. It got Lucifer thrown out of heaven. 
The Bible mentions the word pride 49 times, and he talks about the proud 48 times. So if we take the law of first mention, you know what that is? Scholars want to look in their Bibles and find out what the original meaning is when a word is first used. So in Leviticus 26, verse 19, God says, I will break the pride of your power. I will break the pride of your power. That spirit of independence, I can do this. I'm leading myself. Man's dependence on his own strength is foolishness, really, isn't it? (laughs) Do we decide in the morning to wake up well and healthy? No. No, it doesn't happen that way. Do we decide when we are born into this world or what family we're born into? No, we don't have any say of that. It's all gift. Our strength, our sound thinking, where, we, where we're put in this time period in history is not our choice. So let's look at God's attitude toward pride. Proverbs 16, Proverbs 6, verse 16. There are seven things that God hates. In fact, it says it's an abomination to the Lord. And the number one thing, Proverbs 6, verse 16, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that are swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, he that soweth discord among the brethren. That's quite a list. A liar, somebody that is willing to kill for their own personal gain, that's a murderer. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, constantly devising wicked schemes. That's pathetic in God's eyes. All these things, this whole list of things, are things we wouldn't imagine doing. But at the very top is the thing that nails every one of us, and that's a proud look. The Bible says God hates it. It's an abomination to him. Proverbs 16.5 Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the proverb mouth do I hate. Proverbs 21, 4. A high look and a proud heart is sin. James 4, verse 6. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud but he gives grace to the humble. It's pretty clear what God thinks about pride and arrogancy. There's not even one positive comment. I want to talk to you this morning about why God hates pride so bad. And we're going to talk about eight different reasons. The first reason is pride is so deceitful. Okay, We believe things that we tell ourselves. We make ourselves feel good by telling ourselves that about who we are. So how do we do that? We compare ourselves with other people. You know the Bible says it's not wise to compare yourself among yourself, but that's what we do for self-esteem. That's what we do to prop ourselves up. We compare ourselves with other people. You know, when you had a good day at work and you feel good about what you earned and you feel like you deserved it and then you find out that somebody else does something maybe a little bit less than you and earns a whole lot more than you, all of a sudden you're discontent with what you had made. Isn't that true? We compare ourselves among each other. But when we want to make ourselves feel good, we look at people and put them down and raise ourselves up. We lift ourselves up above above others. So fictitiously, we tell ourselves we're good, okay? Temporarily, we feel good about ourselves because we find people that aren't as good as us. Obadiah chapter, well, Obadiah 3, there is only one chapter, verse 3, God says, the pride of thy heart hath deceived thee. Deception is believing something that is not actually true. So pride enables us to put a mask on so that we pretend or so that we can be somebody who we really are not, something other than what we really are. What we need, what we really need is a desire to please God, okay? We don't have to try to prove ourselves better than other people. That's hypocrisy when we put on a mask. 
We want to please God. We need to have a willingness to know the truth about ourselves. How do you know what's true about yourself? Well, true humility is correct thinking about God and ourselves. So our worth doesn't come from putting other people down, but about understanding our position in Christ, who I actually am. I am a sinner. I need to be saved. I need redemption. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. True humility is correct thinking about God and ourselves. We are somebody when we are in Christ Jesus. So, God hates pride because it's deceitful. Number two, Pride causes us to blame others for our problems, the blame game, the same thing our great, great, great granddaddy did back in the Garden of Eden. And what did Adam do? Well, the woman you gave me caused me to take a bite of this fruit. And Eve said, well, the serpent said it would be good. And just blame, and let's just push it off on somebody else. That's our tendency when something goes wrong, let's find out who can we tack this on to? Who can we blame? So we try the blame game. If I had been born in another family, if I had married somebody else, or if this or that had not happened to me, okay, that's a victim mentality. Okay? It's rooted in pride and self-pity and must be repented of. We are not responsible for what happens to us. You know that? Okay? We have no control about what happens to us. Not the weather, not the sunshine, not your health. You're not responsible. What we are responsible for is how we respond to what does happen to us. That's what we can control. Wow, that's pretty big. So it actually makes a difference how I respond to life's events. It makes a world of difference. I remember struggling with this um, as a young person. There was things I felt weren't fair in life, and you know what? It really wasn't. Life actually isn't fair. Uh, but I thought, you know, other people had it better in their families, and, you know, I, I had some unfortunate relationships. I was angry about this. Even after we got married, I was blaming other people and making excuses for what happened to me. And then I realized, you know what? This is following me around. This is me. This is my problem. In fact, some of the problems that I'm upset about, I had at least 50% or more, maybe 90% of the cause of some broken relationships. So what did I have to do? I have to acknowledge it. You know what? I'm actually part of the problem. I had to go back to that person and ask for forgiveness. And I'm like, I don't want this to control me. I don't even care if they don't offer forgiveness for their part. I just want to be set free. I don't want this to control me. I got freedom from that, and I began to realize my response to life's circumstances is what life's about. It makes all the difference. If I'm going to blame people, I'm going to become a victim, and it's going to follow me everywhere I go. Blaming others takes us down a one-way street. It's a dead-end street. It's called bitterness. It'll eat you up. It'll destroy your happiness and joy. So, pride, God hates pride because it's deceitful. God hates pride because it causes us to blame others for our problems. And the third thing is God hates pride because it causes us to become critical of others. A critical spirit is fed by pride. We tell ourselves, well, I could do it better than that. We're always scrutinizing what other people do. Well, if it would have been done this way, it would be a lot better. Okay, always correcting or instructing others. It must be done my way. My ideas are better. I like my ideas. A critical person is also easily offended. Okay, 
They always need some kind of praise or affirmation because they are at the center of their world. Everybody must see things the way I see them. Don't you have my glasses on? I don't like this. You should do it this way. Benjamin Franklin said, it's the proud that hate pride in others. It's the proud that hates pride in others. A proud man is suspicious of others' hearts and motives, always questioning, now why did they do that? Uh, what do they mean when they said that? That's a little bit of pride. Uh, did they mean that to jab me? And we get very defensive. But listen to this. A humble man is more suspicious of his own heart than he is of anybody else. Okay. Do you question yourself? Well, I probably misunderstood that person. I don't think that's what they meant. Or are you always suspicious of what other people say? I think he meant to hurt me. A humble man is more suspicious of his own heart than he is of anybody else. Do you remember the attitude of the Pharisee praying? Jesus relayed this. The Pharisee stands on the street corner and he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, liars, cheaters. Thank you, God, for saving me. I'm a church-going person. I tithe of everything. Thank you, God, that I go to church. And then Jesus gave us the converse picture. He said, look at the publican on the corner, the man who really understands who he is. He can't even lift his head. He's so ashamed of what he's done in life. He says, God. He don't know what else to pray. God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's all he could pray. That's all we can pray, folks. If we're honest about ourselves, if we're humble enough to admit we have nothing to bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The things that bother you about others are often true about yourself. Okay, so we may sometimes find ourselves in the habit of viewing others with a critical eye. It's rooted in pride and it must be repented of. God has no use for a critic. Okay, number four, God not only hates pride because it's deceitful, it causes us to blame others, it causes us to be critical of others, it causes us to water down sin. When we're proud, we make excuses for the things we do. It's really not that bad. So we make some kind of exceptions to accommodate our nature, you might want to say, okay? Well, I just am that way. That's how our family is. I was born that way. That's how we do things around here. That's just who I am. It's my temperament. Or we may have the attitude, oh, we would never do that around here. Oh, no. We're, we're, um, we don't stoop to that kind of thing. I remember um, meeting a young minister, a young man who had just been ordained in another church outside of our conference, and I wanted to encourage him. That's a high calling. That's an important job to not only preach the gospel, but care for people and listen to people. And then he started telling me about some of the other churches in there, and he said, well, (laughs) at least we don't have some of the problems they have. And he went on to tell me how there's fighting and bickering. There was even one family was hitting another family. He said, no, we don't have those kind of problems in our church. And I thought to myself, well, let's just wait and see. We're all people, and it'll only be a matter of time till you find out what kind of fighting and arguing goes on in your own church. We want to water down sin and not really acknowledge it. The Bible says, if we confess our sin, if we confess our sin, not if we confess our personality quirks or if we confess uh, how we do things around here or our temperament, we need to confess our sin He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's wrong living. It's wrong thinking. It's wrong doing. If we have personality challenges, we don't have to wallow in that all our life. Confess it. Surrender it. Maybe on a daily basis and turn from it. You remember that song we sing? From glory to glory, He's changing me, changing me, changing me. His likeness and image made perfect in me, the love of God shown to the world. 
I wonder if we're allowing God to change us on a regular basis, or do we just make room for acceptable sins in our lives? Excusing or minimizing sin will not change the consequences. We need to call sin what it is and acknowledge it. That takes humility. Here's the fifth thing. God hates sin because it is the greatest of all sins. It is the most horrific sin that is possible to have, and yet it's in our nature. Humility itself is the foundation for every virtue we have, okay? Being humble enough is a great, it's a, is part of greatness. But pride, think about pride, actually eliminates God from our thinking, Psalm 10, verse 4, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Okay? We answer to me. If we don't have God as our authority that we surrender ourselves to, then we are servants of ourselves. Paul said that. Don't you know whom your servants do? That's who you're going to obey? So we have our world filled with people following the American dream. And who are they slaves to but themselves? Okay? Jesus said, take my yoke upon me, upon yourself, and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly. Okay? God wants us to follow him. Pride is the greatest of all sin because it removes all absolutes. If we all individually are following our own selves, if we're all our own boss, what's really true and what's right and wrong? This is where our world's at today. Everything's relative. It destroys absolutes. Everything is relative. So what's right for you is right for you. God bless you. Have fun. Do it. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Do you see where this is taking us? We have the state of California where they are protecting pedophiles If the child is within 10 years of age, the perpetrator's okay. Do you realize that? It's so pathetic. It's disgusting. Romans chapter 1 tells us of men who did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind that's debased and depraved to do those things which are not convenient. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12, it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Now, Paul Harvey used to say, now wash your ears out with this. The psalm says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There's a blessing if we will follow him. The people that he has chosen for in his, his inheritance How do we choose God? How do we pursue that blessing? How do we choose Him to be our God and Lord? Well, 2 Chronicles tells us the very first step is humility. 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What is the order of that? Does God say, I want you to seek, I want you to pray every day? The very first thing he's asking of us is humble ourselves. That's the first thing in having God's blessing on our lives, humility. James reminds us, James chapter 4, the half-brother of Jesus says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he, he will lift you up. He will lift you up. Pride is the greatest of all sins. Number six, it is the very nature of Satan himself. Listen, we have a very clear picture of self-exaltation in Isaiah chapter 14. Lucifer was so enamored with who he was. He was so beautiful. He was so powerful. He was absorbed with himself. And he said, I will ascend unto heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will, I will, I will, I will. Do you ever talk to somebody and count how many times they talk about themselves? I, me, my, this is mine, I did this, I did that. When self is front and center, it sets us up for a fall. 
In fact, self-will disqualifies a man from pastoring and leading a church. Okay? The Bible says, not a novice, lest he be lifted up and think he's somebody more than, than what he is. Self-centeredness makes a lousy father or mother in the home as well. Leadership is actually the role of serving, putting other people's needs first, looking out for those who are entrusted to you. Remember, gentlemen, we did Valiant Man. We watched that video, how important it is to look out for those under us, our wives, our daughters, our sons. It's our responsibility. It's our privilege to protect them. That's the job of a leader, sacrificing our own wishes. And Christ, of course, is our example in this. You think about how he left glory. He left his home in heaven to come down here and walk among us. He suffered with us. He suffered with us and then for us. He did it for us. That's pretty big. Here's number seven. God hates pride because it is the worship of ourselves. Self-adoration, or more subtle, self-esteem is sin. We do not need more of it. We don't need more self-esteem. That's what we call ego. Do you know what ego stands for? Edging God out. Okay, putting him on the back burner. I don't need God right now. This is me. I mean, when I'm ready for God, he'll be, he'll be there for me, won't won't he? See, that's why it's so wrong to put off the Holy Spirit when he nudges us in our lives. We're just putting him off, and we think God will always be there, and when I need him, right before I take my last breath, I'm going to get right with God. Hey, that's not always the case. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God blows like the wind, and we don't know where it's going to come and go. We need to be sensitive to it. We need to call and cry out to God for it, ask Him to work in our lives. He's just not like a tool waiting there or some kind of red button we can press at our whim and wish. The Spirit of God moves and comes and goes. And if we don't take advantage of it, there's no promise that God is going to call us at the moment we think we're going to need Him. Edging God out. James, again, says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. William Law, an old Puritan preacher, said pride must die or nothing of heaven can live in you. Pride must die or nothing of heaven can live in you. We don't need more self-esteem. We need redemption. We need to be redeemed. We need to be rescued from our own self-centeredness. That's where our self-worth comes from. Pride is what's going to keep us from admitting we are wrong. Pride is going to even keep us from being saved. I don't need saved. Did you ever meet anybody like that? I don't need God. That's pride. That's arrogancy. We want to go our own way. I'll tell you the good news, though. God will not turn away from a broken and a contrite heart. He's not going to despise it. God always honors the humble spirit. How do you know if you're broken? Well, let's look at it this way. You will know you're broken if your sin looks big in the light of other people's struggles. Okay? If you're always thinking other people's sins are quite a bit bigger, you know you're not humble. When you realize in the sight of God that you're going to be accountable and your sin is big in your eyes and everybody else has to worry about them, then you know you're humble. Humility is our responsibility. That's something we can do about ourselves, our sin, is take it to God, humble ourselves like the publican and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The final one is number eight. Pride is so destructive. This is why God hates pride. It destroys us. His very creation he made to enjoy a relationship with us if we go our own way, it separates us from God. We go down a road of path of destruction. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Okay? We were not made or created to receive worship. All of us, every one of us, somehow has an inborn nature to want to follow and worship something. Okay? 
So in the, old, in the old days, in the Bible times, we talk about idolatry. They'd carve something out of a piece of wood, and we say, well, we would never do that. Bow down and give food and even sacrifice their own children to try to call the blessing of their gods upon them. Okay? We don't do that with a little piece of wood, but we might with something shinier. Okay? We enslave ourselves to be up with the latest and the greatest, and we work hard and night and day, not for things we really need, but because we want them. It can become idolatry. There is no thing that can save us from our worst enemy, which is death, and there is no one who can save us outside of the man, Jesus Christ. God has chosen Christ to be exalted above every name, and the Bible says that's the name that every knee is going to bow. They're going to finally acknowledge this is the man that did save me or could have saved me or should have saved me. This is the man. This is God's man, and everyone will confess that he is Lord. We need to die to ourself. I want us to think about the cross this morning. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Okay, has Christ called you? Is he calling you? What does the cross look like to you? Okay, is it an ornament or a necklace or something that you hang in your home? Maybe it seems unrealistic. If Christ is calling you to come and die... I don't think it has to. Christ never asks us to do anything that he himself didn't first do. He not only goes before us, he goes with us. And here's the beautiful thing. The cross is a transition point. It changes us from a road of destruction and hell, self-destruction, to a way of life everlasting. It's a turning point. It's wonderful. Why wouldn't you give up something that you could gain the world for? Why wouldn't you do that? A.W. Tozer said there are three characteristics of a man on a cross. The first thing is that he's facing in only one direction. You take a man that's nailed to a cross, only thing he can do is look straight ahead. The second thing is, he has no further plans of his own. He's not going anywhere. He doesn't even have dreams anymore. It's over. The third thing is, he knows there is no going back. Okay? That's what it means to have a turning point in your life. You only have one direction in life, to please the Lord. You have no further plans. Okay? It's not me anymore. And you know there's no turning back. You don't teeter-totter back and forth. I've given myself to the Lord. He's going with me. Death to ourself is the beginning of newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, we should be able to say it together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Andrew Murray said, we should welcome everything that helps us on toward humility. I want to conclude with these final thoughts. I really believe that we need to be reminded of humility. Why do I think that? Well, it's because of the culture we're living in. We have a lot of messages out there that, hey, there's peace and safety. The economy's okay. You know, it's going to be good. We're going to work things out. I'm going to tell you, folks, if that's where our foundation is, we're going to find ourselves confused and disappointed I think soon. We're living in a culture where everything is borrowed. That's the title of the sermon this morning. Everything is borrowed. Does it concern you? Not just financially, but morally, our culture is bankrupt. And the Bible tells us no matter how important we think we are, how pretty, how strong, how secure financially we are, how wise we think we are, we have nothing to claim on our own but our own self-will, and it needs to be surrendered. It should humble us. It should drive us to our knees and revive the spirit of dependency on God. And here is the point. If you forget everything else I said this morning, 
this is what I want you to remember. Humility must come first. There's nothing else. You have to have humility before you repent. You have to have humility before you pray. You have to have humility before you seek God's face. We must humble ourselves in the sight of God if we want Him to bless us. God hates pride because it is so destructive to us. James says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He, he promises to lift you up. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we have nothing to bring you in spite of how we look on the outside or how we pretend to be. There's nothing in us that's worth saving. We have a self-will. We have a self-centered nature. Lord, many times we get caught up in the subtle sins of pride that separate us from your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would continue to weed out in our hearts and our lives the things that would be detestable to you, the things that are an abomination to you. We want to be, we want to be counted as one of your sons and daughters. We want to be counted with Christ. Lord, I pray that the cross would be a real part of turning point in our lives. We would embrace it. We would follow you, even though we don't know the outcome living a life of surrendered humility, listening to your voice, asking you to work in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would awaken that in us while our culture is so heavily borrowed and indebted in so many different ways. They're bankrupt. Lord, help us not to go down those same arrogant, self-sufficient paths, but we rely on you. You are our source of strength. Is there anyone here this morning that would like us to pray with you together? You can raise your hand. Anybody here this morning that feels like they want to confess something to God? Can we pray for you this morning? I'm taking you by surprise. Let's pray. Lord, I pray your blessing on us as your people. We want to acknowledge your Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Nelson.